Hey there, welcome back to another review for the Toby Hooper Marathon, and this time it is Eaten Alive. This is a two disc DVD from Dark Sky Films, which, for those wondering the features, the first disc has a commentary with producer Marty Rustin, actors Roberta Collins, William Finley, and Kyle Richards, and makeup artist Craig Reardon. Actually, didn't listen to the commentary. This too, you have a little interview with Toby Hooper, interview with Robert England, the Butcher of Elmendorf, the Legend of Joel Ball, which was kind of the reference for this movie. So trailers, TV spots, and radio spots, behind-the-scenes slideshow, alternate credits, and title sequences, and some comment cards. For you have a test screen, people write what they thought of the movie. This was Toby Hooper's follow-up to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And it definitely has that same feel, grindhouse, dirty, raw feel to it. It's not as successful with as a film as Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I think there's just a few, you know, there's moments of dead spots where you kind of wanting the fast forward button to hurry it up a little bit while the Texas Texas Chainsaw Master you're like man what's going to happen next and then this one is like okay well let me fast forward a little bit okay but definitely the strongest part of the film is this guy's lead performance Neville Brand as Judd who runs this hotel called the Starlight and for understand, this was under a lot of titles. I'm trying to want to look up what all the titles were: Death Trap, Horror Hotel, and Starlight Slaughter. Starlight Slaughter, I think, would would have been a pretty decent title. Like Death Trap seems pretty ho hum. Like Eaten Alive. It's a pretty decent title, but the, the crocodile, it's in the film, but it's not, and it does eat some folks, but like Neville Brand's character is much more prominent than his croc. Although I like the poster, Meet the Maniac and His Friend. But I guess, I don't know, if I had a pick, I think Starlight Slaughter seems like the better title. I don't know, it just has a better ring to it. Eden Alive, I think because there's a cannibal movie called Eden Alive, so it's kind of, which Eden Alive are you talking about? Are you talking about the cannibal movie? Are you talking about this? Which I like this more than the cannibal movie. But Neville Brand, I think he did a really good job as a psycho. Well, he's trying to be nice. He seems rather nice, but man, when he goes off, he is apeshit crazy. And believably apeshit crazy. Like, man, this guy probably was crazy in real life, this actor. <laughs> and if you're wondering, I mentioned this Joel Ball guy, who that was. Very loosely based. He was also known as the Bluebeard from South Texas, or the Alligator Man. He owned this bar with this live alligator attraction during the 30s in Elmendorf, Texas. And during the time, he murdered several women. And the legend was that he would get rid of the bodies by feeding them to his pet alligators. And in the movie, it's a crocodile, but they're not really basing on that. I know one of the things throughout this film is like, yeah, I was told the croc is from Africa. They never, they can never die. You know what movie you're getting when the very first line of dialogue is Robert England saying, the name's Buck, and I'm raring to fuck. <laughs> That's the first line of the movie, and it's like, you're either with the movie or you're not. And Robert England, I thought he was a lot of fun. He has a pretty decent interview. I actually would have loved to have him on the commentary, but f fun little interview. And... That was a fun character. I guarantee you Quentin Tarantino saw this and took that for Kill Bill when they have a character named Buck. 
Because I think that guy even says, my name's Buck, and I like to fuck, or something like that. But he must have stolen it from this. Well, homage, however you want to call it. But, like, Robert England, he's playing such a sleazy character. Again, my name's Buck, and I'm wearing the fuck. That's the first dialogue of the movie. And Robert England, I think he does a good job. Wants to fuck this woman, I'm guessing, anal-wise. It's a prostitute. She says no. He wants her there. And then this, I guess, sort of owner of the whorehouse. What the hell was her name? The actress who has sort of the prune face, like the Carolyn Jones as Miss Hattie. Yeah, she had this, this sort of this permanent prune face, like. She did good acting wise as her the old owner of the whorehouse, and she's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, Buck. You get two for no extra charge." But then the woman, she realizes she can't hack it as a hooker, as a prostitute, so she gets tipped out. Goes to Starlight Hotel. And what was interesting, what Toby Hooper did is he decided to film all this on a soundstage instead of a real location. Because Toby Hooper wanted a surrealistic twilight world. And that's one of the things, one of the strongest things about the movie is the look of it. Because you get some really, because they shot on the soundstage, you get some weird lighting, some interesting lighting. Sometimes there's some blues, and sometimes just as crazy reds. Like the whole thing is red. And yeah, it makes it as if you really did step into a literal twilight zone. And it gives an interesting feel to the flick. And I would say those are the two best parts of the movie is Neville Brand's psychotic performance, which you buy hook, line, and sinker as a psycho. Uh, it wasn't over the top to me. It was very well done. Very well done. The guy handled it very well. Well, I would say the, the, the three best things would be him, Robert England as Buck. He was fun to watch. Very young Robert England. And the look of the film. Now, the rest of the movie, like that woman, she gets to the hotel. And when he finds out she used to work there, he kind of snaps and starts ripping off her clothes. Kills her with this, I don't know what the hell the weapon he has at first. It's it's like a curved pitchfork, like a weird rake or like a, think of it like a pitchfork but curved at the end. I don't know what the hell it was, but stabs her and feeds her to the croc. And then you have this weird scene where you have a monkey in a cage, and it's all bathed in red, and the monkey just sort of dies in the cage as it's all bathed in red. That's why you get a little bit of a interesting atmosphere with this. And people come upon the hotel. You have this couple. William Finley, who was in Phantom of the Paradise. Uh, his wife, played by Marilyn Burns, and then this daughter. And pretty quickly, the the fucker croc eats the pet dog. And they try to calm the kid down, put her in the hotel. And again, Neville Brand, a lot of times he tosses himself and he's saying stuff like, about getting in his uniform or gotta do what you gotta do. Ain't no distinction. Just he made for a believable psycho to me. I thought he was definitely enjoyed his, his acting in the flick. You fit perfectly in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. William Finley, his character was just weird. I didn't know what his major malfunction was, as Arlie Ermey would say. I guess they really had problems as a couple before because there's this one moment, and I saw my friend Mike OCP's review, he mentioned the same thing. Where he does this weird thing where he, I guess he hates his wife because he's like, put his arm on like this. It's like, it's 
I'm like, is he being electrocuted? Is he having a heart palpitations? Uh, uh, did someone stick a fucking vibrating dildo up his ass? He's just like, <laughs> is, is his brain going to fart out of his body? You know, is that what a brain fart is? I thought I had brain farts, but if this is what it is, I didn't have, I've never had that. What the like? What the fuck is this? Like, is this guy to be a psycho too? And then he starts being weird, like barking, by like steering his own kid by barking like the dog that was just killed, and he's talking about how his eye was guys gouged down. He's looking on the floor for it. I'm like, where the fuck is this going? Is he don't know psycho too? And then, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna kill the crocodile. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck is up with this character? And what was the point of him acting so weird? Because he tries to shoot it and Neville Brand tells him no. And Neville Brand takes his scythe. His scythe. Team one, I keep wanting to say scythe, but I think it's pronounced scythe. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Some, some of the Grim Reaper would have. And fucking kills him. Stabs him. And then when he before he makes the final stab, the croc takes his ass. Uh, he he tosses himself a lot. He takes Marilyn Burns, rips her clothes, and ties her to the bed. Chases a little girl under the house. Mill Ferrer, who's the father of that girl at the beginning, the prostitute. Him and his other daughter arrive, try to ask questions. They go to the sheriff. That's one thing that that hurts the film is this stuff really wasn't that interesting. Uh, Mel Ferrer's character looking for his daughter, going to the sheriff. The sheriff, I don't mind the actor, Stuart Whitman, who plays the sheriff. But his character was fucking pointless in the movie. Like This, is the, this guy's the sheriff. He does absolutely nothing. It's just, okay, let's get you to the, the whorehouse. And then the woman there lies. Yeah, she was never here. That fucking scene was pointless. And then the sheriff is talking with the daughter at the bar. And then he tells Buck, Robert England, to leave. And that whole scene was pretty pointless. And then Mel Ferrer gets back. He gets stabbed through the neck with that scythe. And good effect. Where it's literally stuck in the guy's neck. I thought that was a pretty cool kill. And the guy, Neville Brand's try, still trying to get the daughter under the house. The whole thing with Stuart Whitman is the sheriff and he's with the other daughter at the bar. The only good thing was Robert England. But he says the line, you gotta burn up your ass. Don't mean shit to me, sheriff. <laughs> but him and his girl leave and they go to the hotel just Stuart women's character he was fucking pointless absolutely pointless he didn't even need to be in the movie because he does nothing it's not like the sheriff's going to get there and he gets killed so you get a death scene or he's going to save the day no he's absolutely pointless he is absolutely useless in the fucking movie and then Robert England gets there with his daughter I mean his daughter <laughs> That'd be a different movie if it was his daughter. But gets in with his girl, they're ready to have sex. He hears his crying, walks out, gets pushed into the water, eaten by the croc. And the crocodile, I mean, it's not fucking Jaws or anything. It's not state of the art. But they knew their limitations. They shot it the best they could. And I thought it was handled better here than I've seen in a lot of other movies. Like, they knew... They had low budget on the croc, so I think it was shot. The way they shot was good for what limited how they were limited with their budget on the crocodile. They didn't shoot it over the extent that they could. It was limited usage, so they shot in the limited fashion. I thought it worked well for what it what in what they could do. <clears throat> so
so Robert England gets eaten, that daughter, oh yeah, and then Robert England's, I was actually surprised by this, watching it again, that girl that Robert England was with, she actually gets away, <laughs> she runs off, she finds this guy in a car, and they drive off, I was surprised, I thought she was going to get killed too, but I was surprised she actually got away, I'm like, okay, the other daughter gets there, finds Marilyn Burns, gets her out. They're both chased by the killer. Uh, that one daughter is saving the little girl from getting eaten by the croc while Marilyn Burns pushes the killer into the water and the croc eats him. The sheriff gets there and he was useless. Part of me wondered, man, you know what would be even more bizarre if Robert England how sleazy of a terror he is if he became the hero of the movie. That would have been so unique. So bizarre. I, I think I would have liked the movie even more. Like this guy that the first thing we see is I'm wearing the fuck. And is fucking with this woman. That just would I mean maybe it wouldn't make any sense. But I don't know. Maybe it's like. You know, a lot of time, I mean, look at Riddick. I mean, he's evil, but that he's like a good evil. He's like, he's sleazy and he's an asshole, but it would have been, it would have been more interesting if he saved the little girl than how the killer got dispatched. And that just would have made it a little bit more unique. So while I think it does have a couple pacing problems, Marilyn Burns, she's all right. Uh, William Finley, his character is just weird. Mel Ferrer, he was just there to do a good death scene with the weapon in his neck. Stu Whitman was completely pointless as the sheriff. So he had some pacing issues, some scenes that were not the most interesting, like Mel, Mel Ferrer's quest to find his daughter and stuff with Stuart Whitman in the bar. The scene where Neville Brand is chasing the little girl under the house felt like it went on a bit too long. But overall, I just say I like Eaten Alive. It has that grungy, raw atmosphere that Chainsaw Master 1 had. It had some fun, unique lighting, especially when it was everything was red. It made a bit of a surreal atmosphere. Neville Brand did a really good job as a psycho, bottom hook line sinker. Robert, Robert England, he was fun to watch in his scenes as Buck. And, you know, the, with the crocodile, they used it the best they could with the limited budget. At least the ending, it wasn't a sequel bait ending. It wasn't a downbeat ending. You know, it had an ending. It wasn't, you know, the, the killer gets his just desserts. He gets his comeuppance. At least there's that. The soundtrack has that weird, more sound than music type of quality that Chainsaw Master 1 had, and I, I it had that same weirdness to it that I did in mind. Yeah, overall, um, I liked Eden Alive. Not as good as Chainsaw Master 1, but I thought it was. It was a decent follow-up to Chainsaw Master. I thought this was a decent flick. I liked it. But hey, that's just my thoughts. So, thanks for watching my review of Eden Alive. Pretty decent flick. Uh, next up will be my review of the 1981 film, The Fun House. Which, that was the Screen Factory cover. And then that was a cover a lot of people found the movie on VHS. So, see you guys next time. Bye-bye.